everyone. Every month, in 500 or so cafes, bars, pubs, theatres, shopping centres, school halls, libraries, art galleries, and a blood donation centre if you happen to be in Stanford in California, somewhere between 40 and 70 people meet to have a couple of hours conversation. A conversation that just happens to be about science and technology rather than soap operas or football. That, in essence, is Café Scientifique, or Café Sci, or Science Café, or Imbizzo, or Ido Batakai, Wischenbergstadt, Science Salon, Science on Tap, Science in the Pub, whatever you call it, Café Scientifique are coffee houses for the 21st century. Places where people can come together as equals, for the price of a cup of coffee or a glass of wine, to discuss the issues in science and technology that affect us all. Cafes happen in pleasant, comfortable, familiar venues, not scary academic places where only scary academic people can go, but places where anyone can walk in off the street and feel comfortable. And that informality is absolutely essential to a successful cafe. The nature of the venue shapes the nature of the interaction. If we walk into a cafe, we expect to have a conversation. If we walk into a lecture hall, we expect to be lectured at. Café Scientifique started almost simultaneously in Lyon in France and in Leeds in the UK. In Leeds, Duncan Dallas, who was a TV producer, although despairing of ever getting any decent science on television, happened to be reading the obituary of Marc Sauté, who founded the Café Philosophique movement in France. Hmm, thought Duncan. That could work for science. So he persuaded a local bar owner to host the evening. He persuaded a friend to come along and be the speaker. Got a few friends in, spread the word, and Café Scientifique was born. Although it owes its nature to the legacy of Café Philosophique, Café Scientifique owes its format to a noisy coffee machine. In that bar in Leeds, there happened to be an incredibly noisy coffee machine that completely drowned out the speaker. So the bar owner obligingly turned it off. And in the rush for drinks and coffee that when the speaker had finished, conversations got started, questions flowed, and really, no one wanted to stop talking when they sat down again. So now cafes have a very simple short talk, break, discussion format. At the beginning of the evening, the speaker, who's maybe a scientist, engineer, medical researcher, perhaps a journalist or writer about science, opens the evening by giving a very short introduction, 20, 25 minutes, to the topic of the evening. Usually it's the work that they're currently doing. Then we have a break for drinks, to talk to the people around us. And then we come back together for the heart of the evening. An hour or so of questions, comments, thoughts, opinions. Sometimes from the participants to the speaker. Sometimes from the speaker to the participants. More often than not from among the participants themselves. It's like a great big friendly dinner party. You know, everybody kicks back, gets a glass of wine, has a good chat. Because cafes happen in quite ordinary venues, they're very low-tech. Occasionally PowerPoint, although we really discourage people from that if, we, if they will. Hardly any need for a microphone. It's a conversation, and in conversation, people are equals. It's a cafe. People are sitting around tables with drinks and with food. Any time, a good number of the people have got their backs to the speaker. There's no stage, no lectern, no front. The balance of time and power in a café scientifique lies very much with the participants and hardly at all with the speaker. And that's just about the opposite of most communication mechanisms. The simplicity of that format means that it really easily adapts to different cultures and different locations. In France and Denmark, for example, they quite often have three or four speakers speaking for five minutes each. 
because they feel the need to have a very balanced, broad view. In Uganda, and cafes are spreading incredibly quickly across Africa, cafes often take place in what are called malwa joints, where everyone sits around a giant cauldron of the local homebrew and discusses the topic of the evening. In Belgrade, they have a cake, shaped or flavoured to suit the topic. In Japan, participants often put their questions by text message to avoid having to publicly be seen to question their elders and betters. Cafes have had music, play readings, art exhibitions, comedy nights, quizzes. They've gone into schools, they pop up at festivals, they even happen in academic conferences. This can come about because Café Scientifique is an organisation without any organisation. There's no one in charge, there's no central control. The network has spread gradually, emergently, evolved. From that café in Leeds came the very fine café in Nottingham. One in Glasgow, Newcastle, Edinburgh, Bristol, Brighton. Because there was a website, it hopped across the Atlantic to North America, to Canada, to South America, over to Australia and New Zealand, and of course, right across Europe. And it's still happening now. Every month I get three or four emails from people far and wide wanting to start new cafes, and I try and help them in any way I can. Everybody who's part of Café Scientifique is a volunteer. All cafes are autonomously and independently organised in the place where they take place. The people who run cafes aren't professionals. They're just people who love science and technology and believe deeply in the importance of bringing that into our culture. I'm a volunteer. I don't organise cafes anymore, but I look after the website. And through the website, I try and help and support new cafes as they emerge. I don't actually know how many cafes there are. I know that there are about 70 across the UK. I know that there are about 500 around the world. But I also know that there are some that I don't actually officially know about. And that's fine. Some cafes choose to belong to the network. Others perhaps start independently, and only three or four years down the line do they realise that there's an international network they could be part of. Just last week, I had an email from someone in New Zealand who said, hey, I've been running a cafe for three or four years. Can I join your network? <laughs> of course. Welcome to the family. The fact is that I could not possibly control all that complexity from my little desk on a Saturday morning. It just couldn't be done. All I can do, the only way it will work, is to let it go. I can frame the principles, I can advise, but in the end I have to trust that organisers will take it from there. As I said, everybody who organises a cafe is a volunteer. And venues are likewise volunteers. Very often they come for free. On a quiet night, the idea of having 40 or so extra people buying drinks and coffee is a really powerful argument for a bar manager. Likewise, Costs are very low, which is a good thing, because there isn't any money. <laughs> speakers very... We don't actually ask speakers to come for free, but we're really glad if they do. Their costs tend to be low. They're often local, or the kind of people who so love talking about their work that they'll do it for their bus fare. However, speakers' expenses have to be met. And most cafes do this by literally passing a hat round in the interval to collect donations. What people get out of cafes is enormously rewarding. For participants, it's a chance to engage with a subject that they may not ever have even known they were interested in before they got there. About half the people who come to a cafe come because they're interested in the topic of the evening, and about half come just every month because they just love talking about science. They also get to get up close and personal with working scientists and technologists. For speakers, it's a really warm, relaxed and intimate way to talk about our work. It's especially nice for early career researchers who might be taking those first steps in public engagement. 
However, they do tend to get asked the kind of questions and interact with the kind of experience that they wouldn't normally get in their professional lives. It's not uncommon in a medical cafe, for example, to have someone say, you know, I have the illness you're researching. I said earlier on that we don't have any rules and regulations in Café Scientifique. There's nobody in control. And that's true, we don't. But we do have one mantra. You're not allowed to start a question by saying, this might be a stupid question, but... Because any question that starts like that is invariably insightful and often incredibly difficult to answer. You know, the kind of questions that come up are, you know, what is a hadron, and why do they have to collide? <laughs> Who funds your research? Why do prions do that? Those sorts of questions are extremely difficult to answer, and not the kind of ones that you normally come across. So, that's Café Scientifique. Chaotic, complex, dynamic, growing, no one in charge, no strict rules and regulations, no one right way to do things. It's a network that everywhere that cafes are, they are truly local. But as you can see from the map, it's a network that is entirely global. Thank you. <laughs>